great to be here. Um, first of all, Matt, thanks for that. Thank you for um, the notices and Jane and, the, and Pam and this, Dave. Thank you for the music this morning. Absolutely spot on exactly what um, I'd have asked you to do to prepare for um, what I'm about to bring. So today, um, I actually volunteered to do this particular um, Bible study, this particular talk, sermon, um, because uh, God told me at that time, yeah, that one's, that one's yours. I, I didn't really understand why. Um, but to be frank, he's, he's blessed me greatly in the preparation for this. Um, so I've been blessed and I, I genuinely hope you will be as well. Um, so Father, we just give you this time. Lord, you've got something to say to us. And I pray that um, one, I deliver it well. And two, everybody here would be able to hear and understand what you've got to say. I ask you to bless us as your people. And may we bless you. May we bring you pleasure as we, um, as we listen, as we respond, as we move with you. And Lord, we just pray against the evil one now in whatever shape he may come. Distractions, thoughts, noise, whatever it is. I pray there'll be nothing in the way for everyone here to hear you today. Amen. So... <clears throat> Um, let's, Matt's already done a little bit of this, but let's just quickly give a summary of what we're doing. So this is the, we run two series in our Bible uh, sermons um, at the same time. Um, one we've been looking at is hope, and that's been ongoing, and we've done more sermons in hope, about hope. But this one is about, um, if the theme is called, We Are Church. Okay, and this is the third one of the series of We Are Church. Um, and the, very simply, the idea is that we're trying to show you that church is not a building. It's not an institution because people talk about the church and they're talking about the institution. Um, when we talk about the King's Church, we're not talking about a thing. We're talking about us. We are the King's Church. Um, and what's beautiful is that the Bible has lots of pictures in it about how God views us and how he views the King's Church. He actually put, he's put them in here so we can see them. So we've been looking at that. And um, Fiona talked about um, being pilgrims on a journey and the whole thing about the fact that we're not, um, we're not there yet. You know, we're actually looking ahead and we're on this journey with Jesus and we're looking into the future. Um, Clive, it was about being the temple, the holy dwelling. So it's no longer a building in Jerusalem where, where God meets with people. He meets with us here, now, wherever. We are God's temple. Okay, we can be the point at where God meets earth and meets man. And Clive was talking about that. So... I've got the privilege about talking about this metaphor, and I was checking that I got the right thing there, um, of being the bride of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but um, as a man, the concept of being a bride is quite a, an interesting concept, um, and it's not something, isn't something that naturally comes to mind. Um, but the Bible uses all sorts of images, and so, so it talks about everybody being sons. So we expect women to cope with being a son. Um, and it talks about all, all sorts of other images with gender. Um, so the gender actually is not important. It's meant to focus us on what, what the role is about and what's, what's happening. So let's get, let's get into the meat of this. So I'm going to read you three very short passages just to give you some of the references in the Bible to us being the bride. Okay, and then I hopefully I'll link them back and you'll make sense to you. So I'm going to start in Revelation. There's two in Revelation, two wonderful pictures um, at the end of Revelation. And I'll read the, the first one from Revelation 19. Um, and then the second one from uh, Revelation 21. So very quickly, as I say, Revelation 19 verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude a roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunders shouting hallelujah for the lord our god almighty reigns let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready fine linen and bright and clean was given her to wear fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints the angel, then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
And he added, these are the true words of God. Then in 21, if we start just at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was, seated, who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Notice that both those two passages are underlined by the fact that it states, this is true. Okay. And let's just flip back to Ephesians. And the, the, the passage I want to focus on is in um, Ephesians 6. No, it's not. I can't write, write, write down. Thank you. Yes. 25. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives with their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now that's just two passages, and in fact you can link, I think, well, I can't remember exactly how many, but there are numerous, numerous passages throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New, where it's clear that the relationship between God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, with us, is described in this marriage relationship, where we are married to him, and at the point, we are the bride coming to that marriage, okay? I don't know if you really understand it. I don't know if I really understand this. I don't think I really understand just how much God loves me. When I think of a bride, I think of me with my wife walking up the aisle towards me and me turning and looking at her and seeing her and that feeling of love at that moment. And indeed, the choice that I've made since then to love her in difficult times, in good times, the choices she's made to stay with me and to support me through all sorts of difficult things. Those choices that are love. But all of those pale into absolute insignificance in comparison to the way that God, the way that Jesus, the way that the Holy Spirit loves you and me. To prove it, let me just quickly run through a few things. We rejected God. He never rejected us. We turned away from him. He has never turned away from us. And the whole of the Bible, this is a story of him chasing after us, wooing us 
reaching out to us, talking to us, offering himself to us, blessing us, challenging us, pleading with us, doing all he possibly can to woo us back into the relationship that he always has always always wanted with us the relationship he created for right at the very beginning he didn't have to do any of that you know he's God I'm a speck of dirt but he reaches out to me now I, I think sometimes you know I get very pleased with myself when um, you know, when I do something nice for Anna you know mentally tick off a brownie point there you know I did that task you know if I, if I put my foot in it sometime you sometimes go and do something nice to try and put it right okay that's, that's not what we're talking about here God isn't trying to put right because he's made a mess of it God loves us so much that he sees us in trouble and reaches out to us and offers a way back he loves you so much that he literally would give up anything for you anything And this is the God who calls us in this imagery, calls to us that we should be his bride. God loves us from the bottom of his heart. He loves us to bursting point. God wants to spend, and I use this phrase carefully, the rest of his life with you and me. And that means eternity, forever. He wants to know me. He wants to know you as fully as we can possibly be known. He wants to know all your problems and all your weaknesses. He wants to know your strengths and, your, and all the things you love. He wants to be with you in everything you do, in everything I do. He wants to be with us, intimate, close, walking every step of the way together, he can get closer to us than anyone else. And he wants that. So I've been married to Anna, my wife, for 40 years this year. 40 years. Um, so I know a little bit about what being a husband is. But my knowledge is insignificant compared to his. What's your darkest secret? He knows it. What's your greatest pleasure? He knows it. He knows all your hopes, all your fears, all your doubts. And all he wants to do is just love you. Love you, love you, love you. When we're looking at Jesus's, uh, of the God's love for us, of course, the greatest act of love is the one that he did 2,000 years ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life. He gave his whole life for us so that we could spend eternal life with him as he wanted us to as he wants to he wants us to know him as well as he knows us and he provides a way for us to do that he gives us the, the opportunity to do that so what what is your part what is my part how do we engage with this God who loves us so much well Clive mentioned early on about the um, other culture 
where he used the illustration of um, a person saying, you know, in a sense, uh, an arranged marriage. You know, how will you love her? Well, I'll love the one I choose, you know, the bride I get. He made a choice. You see, we have in this, in the West, a notion that somehow love and marriage is all about emotional feeling. And indeed, with brides, um, there's an awful lot of time of a bride spent preparing herself on the outside, sometimes at the cost of preparing herself on the inside. There's a choice to be made, not a choice of how pretty we're going to look, but a choice of how seriously we're going into this relationship. Yeah. So, so our part to play in this is a choice. Are we going to choose Jesus? Are we going to choose to love back the person who loves us so much? The person who's calling to us, who's trying to woo us, who's done everything he possibly can to win us? Or are we not? Now you might say, well, I made that decision years ago. I've chosen that already. But you see, I know for a fact, okay, within my own marriage, that every single day I have to choose to love Anna. Because if I don't, we drift apart. If I don't choose to love her, then some of the things she does starts to annoy me because I annoy her. And we, those are the things that we think, oh, can't be 40 years. I've had to put up for this 40 years. But I can choose to get annoyed with those things or I can choose to love Anna. So I try and make that choice every day. Sometimes, if I'm being honest, I forget. Sometimes I get cross and I choose not to. But you see, God's not like that. Every single day, he chooses to love me. He chooses to love you. And our place now is, are we going to choose every day? I don't know about you, but I think the last two years have been some of the cha most challenging of my life. There have been some very strange things happened. Um, and my emotions have gone up and down and there's been a lot of confusion at times. But I think now is the time that God is asking us, do you want to be my bride? Do you want to be with me? I asked um, a few women in the church what it was like to be a bride, because having not been a bride myself, I thought, let's go to the people who have been brides. Makes more sense, yeah. What's it like? And, and different people came back to me, but um, Verity um, wrote me uh, something on WhatsApp, um, and I think it actually sums this up really well. So I want to read it to you. This is what Verity said. I would say the whole thing about being a bride is it's the, st the start of something new. Com something you can't quite imagine, but you're hoping and trusting is going to be wonderful. Each step while preparing, and it's then represented as you walk down the aisle, is a step in trusting your life to, the per to this person. It's lovely to mark the occasion by being at your absolute best with amazing clothes, hair, makeup, and also with joy and excitement you feel. And you feel like this is the pinnacle of who you can be and who you want to be. You feel engulfed with love, both for the one you're marrying and for all those you have to celebrate with you. And thank you for everybody when you see the video. I think that sums it up really well. Do you want today to be a bride of Christ? You do it by choice. He's offering his hand to you. And our choice is, how will we respond? We have the choice to spend eternity in an intimate relationship like no relationship we've ever had 
ever experienced. In the passage it said that we're given clothes of righteousness to wear, fine linen. That's Jesus' clothes. He paid with his blood for those clothes. He gives us his righteousness. You know what the most wonderful thing about that, or one of the most wonderful things about that is? When we put on his clothes, they start to affect us because the Holy Spirit comes in us. And we can be righteous ourselves in our actions. And that's why it says the righteous acts of the saints. We are given righteousness and then indeed we can become righteous. I want to be that person. Jesus makes me a better person. I want to be his bride. I want that now. I didn't at the beginning. I was scared at the beginning. I was scared he was going to take something off me. That I would be less. That I would not be an individual. That this relationship would overwhelm me. Instead now, I want to be. I hope you do too. So what we're going to do is um, after coffee, we're having communion. And what I'd ask is, as you take the communion, as you take the cup and the bread, as you remember how much Jesus loves you, that in your turn, in your heart, it doesn't need to be to me. This is not about a profession to keep for anybody else. Jesus knows your heart. Do you want to be his bride? You can tell him then. In that intimate moment, you and him. Father, I just give you this now. I pray for all the stuff that I've, you know, I've said wrong and all the things I, I didn't say the way you wanted. I pray that you will wash those away. But Lord, now, for each of us, fill us. You help us now. I want to be your bride. I believe there's lots more to do as well. Amen.